Charlie Morgan, it is such a pleasure. Look at this, Christmas time, Christmas tree, jumpers, wine, which we're gonna have very handy during this uh, interview, fireplace going, but also one of my favorite pastimes, of course, talking about music. Charlie Morgan, welcome to Rhythms. Thank you. <laughs> and how do I even begin to intro you, Charlie? Uh, next year you celebrate 50 years in the industry, in the business. Um, I, I mean, you've worked with so many countless artists. Of course, there was the 13 years uh, at recording and touring with Elton, mm -hmm. but um, there's just so much more. i tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna borrow the words of Oscar-winning composer and producer, Hans Zimmer, who you also worked with, to intro you properly. So good old Hans says, Charlie Morgan is a multi-talented musical artist who excels in all styles of popular music as a performer, composer, and producer. His skills have placed him in high demand with the world's top film composers, as well as popular performers with a wide range of styles, including Elton John, Kate Bush, Pete Townsend, Paul McCartney, and Wham! And there's gonna be more we will discuss. What I find so fascinating is that Anybody out there watching this interview would have heard your drumming, most likely, at some point in their life. <laughs> and so, next year, 50 years, looking back, I don't even know where to begin. What would you say are some of your highlights over those 50 years? Um, playing Live Aid with Elton. Oh, gotta ask you about Live Aid. Can, can I ask you about that? Yeah. I mean, there's few people in the world that would have had the experience of actually being on stage for Live Aid 1985. What do you remember from that? I have one viv vivid memory. Uh, it was really hot. Unlike most British summers, it was extremely hot mm -hmm. in the middle of July. And um, But literally five minutes after we went on stage, um, there were people fainting in the audience in front of us and being carried off. Yeah. Oh, really? Um, yeah, they were being carried off by the St. John's ambulance and put on the side and, because, you know, it was so hot down in the marsh pit, if you like. Hmm. On stage, on drums, Charlie Morgan. But literally five minutes after we went on stage, um, the heavens opened and it was a massive relief for everybody. Oh, it was there a was relief. A shower. There, okay. was a, there was a, a rainstorm uh, um, a, a, no, in five minutes into our, uh, into right. our performance. Mm -hmm. um, and Elton actually was doing Benny and the Jets. And he said the spotlight's been known to hit something that's changed the weather. And that line, he pointed up to the sky. Now, if you look at the footage, you you see, see a point. Spotlight's hitting something that's been known to see, change now the we, Now we know and why. Points to the sky. Yeah. And that's because the cloud burst had just started. Yes, right. Do you remember, I mean, I can't imagine what it was like backstage. Do you remember like who you bumped into? It was Bedlam. It was chaos. It was <laughs> amazing chaos. Uh, actually, one of the people I bumped into was uh, The Who's Roger Daltrey, mm -hmm. with whom I had worked the previous year. I'd done a number of TV shows with him the previous yeah. year in 1984. And he came around the corner and he, he kind of looked at me and went, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm playing with Elton. And, you know, um, obviously the guys from Queen Elton and I watched Queen from the side of the stage. Wow. We were actually stage left, mm -hmm. watching from the stage left wings. And um, Elton turned to me halfway through and 
looked at me and said, Freddie's on fire tonight. And, I, and I'm, I'm so glad we've, we've all been able to kind of revisit that through the Freddie Mercury biopic because they focused on that so much. Yeah, yes. the, the Bohemian Rhapsody movie. Yeah, um, yeah um, although I would take exception to that because when they recreated it, Elton and I weren't standing on the same stage. <laughs> it's empty. They missed that. And we were actually standing on, right there. You know the truth. And we knew we had to follow it as well. Oh, you followed that. We followed that. Oh, wow. They were on before us. Okay. We had to do 45 minutes and they did, I think, a 30 minute set. So they piled all the good stuff into 30 minutes. Right. And then, because they were actually at the last wow. minute. Elton was already slated to do this, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And Queen, they were, if you look at the biopic, they, they, they were correct in the, in the um, chronicling that um, there was some doubt as to whether Queen were A, together as a band. Freddie was doing Ooh, his solo album. Okay. And uh, they'd kind of gone their separate ways and then they got back together again to do Wembley. Oh, that's do, right. This is, that's there. right. This is 1985. Yeah. Yeah. 80, yes. Wow. Okay. So um, they were only put in at the last minute, from what I can remember. Mm. From what I can mm. They were a last minute edition. And there were so many incredible bands on yeah. all the way through the day. Mm. I mean, the Who went on earlier, as far as I remember, as well. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. I've got another on stage experience that I, I love the story that I've read about you and I'm gonna set this up with some clues okay, okay. so I'm gonna say um, 55,000 people in the audience drummer with an allergic reaction and Billy Joel uh, what yes. does that bring back uh, Philadelphia Veterans Stadium the uh, second ever show for the face-to-face -face Billy Joel Elton John um, tour that we did in 1994. Elton had chosen to go on first and then Billy and then we'd go on at the end all both bands together, together yeah. and alternate Elton and Billy songs Okay. Um, in what we used to call the great train wreck at the end. Great Myself train off. wreck. <laughs> yeah, they call it the great train wreck. Well, because you know, it had some interesting moments yeah. with both bands, both bands playing together. We were all really good friends apart from anything. Mm. Um, but I was toweling myself off after our one and three quarter hour set and this golf cart came skidding around the corner into our compound and uh, one of our assistants said, Charlie, Bill, Charlie, you've got to go on, uh, Liberty's down, but Billy wants you to go on stage and, and fill in. I went, oh, yeah, funny, ha ha, very funny. And he said, no, it's serious, he's had, a, he's had an allergic reaction to some food that he had in, in, in catering and his, his throat started to close up and they've they've transported him off in, by ambulance and Billy is filling in doing solo stuff right now and sure enough I, I raced back and they they raised my drum our drum kits were on hydraulic risers so they raised okay. my kit up and, right. uh, and Billy um, kind of introduced me and said uh, um, Liberty's uh, ill and he's got to go off to hospital and uh, we, Elton's drummer Charlie has agreed to come and fill in for us. So, yeah. I, and and I, I've read a testimonial from, from Billy Joel about you. He said he couldn't imagine any other drummer in the business being able to do this. But I mean, what, I want to get in your head. How, how did that feel? Uh, in front of 55,000 people and you're starting to play music in your playbook? Well, uh, the show must go on. I mean, uh, <laughs> the, the, this is this is inbred into us, I think, you know. It's whatever happens, the show must go on. We must yeah. produce a show for the, for the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was no, I didn't think twice about getting up there and doing it. But there yeah. was one moment, um, I remember Billy kind of lent into the microphone and said, I gotta explain something to Charlie. And he came up to me, he, he left his, his piano, came up to me and said, okay, so this is a kind of a reggae, kind of a shuffle. Uh, uh, and he's trying to explain the song. And In I, front of 55,000 yeah, people. I said, uh, well, he's, uh, he's off mic, so yes. he's explained to me. And I said, what is the song? And he said, only the good die young. And I said, oh, I know that one. Because I was a huge yes. Billy Joel fan. Yes. I was a massive Billy yes. Joel fan anyway. 
And so he walked back to this, walked back to his piano, sat down, and he leant into the microphone. And said, he says he knows it. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> and started the intro yeah. to Only the Good Die Young, and I oh. kind of jumped in. After this song, you got 15 minutes to have a whiz, okay? Hey, Cesare! Come out, Virginia, don't let me wait. You got the liquor, stop, but it's too late. Ah, but sooner or later, comes down to fate. Might as well be the one. Uh, Charlie, you explain this so practically and so pragmatic. The thing about it is that the adrenaline is flowing, but yeah. there's no anxiety because you're just basically concentrating. Uh, it's a Zen moment. Yeah, I mean, in the moment. On stage anyway is in a Zen moment, moment as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I'm not thinking about, did I leave the light on in my bedroom uh, or <laughs> shopping when list. do I when do I need to do my Groceries, washing yeah or have, how many pairs of underpants have I got left <laughs> you know do I need to do washing at the next hotel <laughs> none of that goes in through your brain no. if you're if you're really at the top level performing it's a zen moment so nothing exists wow. outside you are completely blinkered nothing exists outside yes. that moment yeah that that remind that reminds me of a question I, I always find interesting. Um, and then you've had so much of both in your career. If you had to choose between touring and live performances or the session recording, which one kind of would you go with if you had to? I think it was Rick Morata or Jeff Picaro. It might have been both of them in a very boozy evening we had in 1986 at Rick Morata's house. Speaking of boozy evenings, yeah, please, cheers. I don't want to be the only one. Cheers. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're talking about touring and doing session stuff. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the time I met Elton, I was a session player. I was pretty well exclusively doing sessions. Okay. And mm -hmm. he came across me on a Nick Kershaw album, Nick, one of Nick Kershaw's first two albums, because yeah. I played on both of those. Mm. And uh, he was doing a session where Nick Kershaw and um, George Michael were coming to do backup vocals. And he said something about, oh, I really like the drummer that's on your material. Who is he? Yeah. And Nick very kindly said, he's a guy called Charlie Morgan. Mm -hmm. And he's the go-to guy for my producer, Peter Collins. And, uh, and thus, I was brought into the sessions for the Ice on Fire album, where Elton was trying out different rhythm sections. Um, but so I was just doing session work and then he offered me live touring and I thought it was a, something I couldn't possibly refuse. But well, I think um, Rick Morato and Jeff Picaro and I were discussing this, the fact that in order for you to play sessions successfully, it was nice to get out on the road on occasion to, to get some live experience under yes. your belt because it really helped with the studio experience okay, so okay. i'm not sure that i mean i know nashville is very much like this nashville asks you well are you a studio cat or are you a live player so in nashville i'm constantly being asked are you alive See? Yes. are you studio or live and i say i'm both yeah um because i always felt that to be a, a well-rounded musician you had to do both Gotta have some, uh, gotta have some fuel as well, as well as the alcohol. Speaking of the studios and a certain work ethic, something you said to me that I found quite, quite intriguing about Elton. Let's go back to Elton years for a moment. Is um, and you said he had a certain work ethic, almost like clockwork. He would come in and it's like nine to five almost. Yeah, the studios would be, um, we'd be booked in the studio on a seven day a week. 24 hour a day lockout. Okay, yes. Um, but he would work Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. till 6 p.m., really. Mm. It was like an office job. Mm. Yeah, I mean, very often what would happen is he'd start the day, he'd come in, um, and come in around 9 o'clock, probably between 8 30 and 9. Mm. Bernie Toppin would give him a lyric book. Yeah. With some beautifully illustrated lyrics. Okay. And he'd be reading the lyrics that Bernie had written in the car on the way in. Somebody would be driving him in from Windsor. Mm -hmm. And um, he would come in and he'd have a lyric that he had some inspiration to write to. 
and he'd open up the book and he'd put it on the music stand, on the piano. And he'd say, I'm going to write to this. And then the, the um, assistant engineer would start a tape running in the back of the studio, mm -hmm. um, just for reference. Because there's a microphone on the piano and you know a microphone for his vocal. And he'd start pounding out ideas. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he'd ask them to rewind and have a listen, okay, and uh, work on that. And then they had to wind forward again and hit the record button. Mm -hmm. But he would basically create a song demo in the one hour between nine and 10 o'clock. And sometimes we were in the studio watching it going on. If he hadn't got some kind of rough idea mm -hmm. of how the song went, uh, within uh, 15 to 20 minutes, we could almost bet if he was still pounding out the same ideas an hour later and he hadn't completed the song, yeah. we could pretty well guarantee it wasn't going to make it on the album. Yes, okay. If he was really going at it 20 minutes in mm -hmm. and he had a completed demo within 30 minutes, right. then we were definitely going to be tracking it in a day or two. Mm. Can you remember some, some of those tracks that we all would know instantly? That happened like that? It happened so quickly? Yeah, Believe, which was off the really? made, made in England album. Yeah. believe he just uh, and actually with that one he wanted he had me set up some ideas mm -hmm. and I remember he wrote believe to a tabla loop that I'd created that went yes and he just had me play that loop mm -hmm. and then he played the song to that and actually in the end we um, we tracked to that tabla loop and a click. So I had a chat with co our co-producer Lisa, Lisa back there in the background, <laughs> and I'm like, how do I even start introducing all of the artists that Charlie has worked with over the years? And so since it's Christmas, and we do have a Santa hat here, um, Lisa, wearing, can, uh, uh, we have the most incredible jumpers <laughs> ever in the world. Um, Lisa came up with an idea. So we've got a Santa hat and you're gonna choose a name and you tell us like uh the thing you most remember about working with this artist so let's give this a try lisa here we go what's your idea okay here. all right <coughs> paul mccartney ah early 87 i got a phone call from paul mccartney's management said he was trying out different rhythm sections and would i uh, consider coming down to try out. I went down to his studio in, in Sussex. Did you need to check your diary and just make sure there was nothing else? There wasn't. Important? Any, there wasn't anything going on. Believe me, there was nothing going on that was more important <laughs> than Paul McCartney than having a couple of days with Paul McCartney. Yes. And I went down to the studio, and I remember it vividly. Um, and it was a very interesting band because the lineup were all people who had done something major before. Uh, the keyboard player, well, we had two keyboard players playing with us, um, and they were Phil Pickett from Culture Club, mm -hmm. and uh, another guy who's a friend of mine, Nick Glennie Smith, who was a major session keyboard player, and is actually now, I believe, um, one of Hans Zimmer's orchestrators Ooh. and conductors. Nice. He does the orchestrations for, and he conducts the, the orchestra. Um, but Nick Lenny Smith also um, had the um, uh, claim to fame of playing the synthesizer solo on What's Love Got to Do With It. Oh, Tina Turner. Tina Turner. Ooh. Dwayne Eddy was playing guitar with us, who is a legend in himself. I mean, mm. He's a, a major icon of rock and roll from the 60s. Well, we recorded several tunes. We were there for two days and we recorded several tunes. Um, Paul was playing bass. Obviously, he oh, wow. did yeah. fill in, you know. The song, song called Rockestra that we did, which is an instrumental, mm -hmm. um, 
made it onto one of Dwayne Eddy's albums. So I ended up playing with an icon of the you know, rock and roll icon of the 60s. Wow, and fantastic. And ended up featuring on his album. Uh, I would look him up when we went over there on tour. Uh -huh. And uh, he'd come and pick me up in his, um, in his truck and he'd take you to go and eat Mexican. <laughs> okay. he, he had this amazing Mexican <laughs> restaurant, uh, I think called Rosarita's. I think um, I, I will prove over this interview, anyone watching this, will have heard your drumming at multiple, <laughs> many multiple times over their lifetime. Okay, next. Who's next out of the hat? Barry Manilow. Barry Manilow, <laughs> that's a change. Wow. <clears throat> Slightly. <laughs> I have a friend in Los Angeles, a guy called Scott Erickson, who does a lot of arrangement and production and writing as well. He writes, the, he writes a lot of music for Disney. Mm -hmm. And I got to the point where I was doing a lot of Disney sessions for him. Right. Can I just ask you about Disney sessions? So yep. you will have heard your drumming on Disney. Some of the uh, things some, as yeah. well. Yeah, we we did um, we did the parade music for um, Disneyland Paris and Disneyland Tokyo. You know. I'm sorry. Is there anything you've not done? Maybe that's a better question for me. <laughs> Amazing. Um, oh, sorry. Back. Barry Manilow. Barry Manilow. <laughs> so they flew me into Los Angeles. And I spent three days recording, I think he recorded seven tracks on Barry Manilow's Hits of the 80s. Okay, next name. Go in here. Kate Bush. Ah. Oh, well. Three albums with her now. Yeah, three, four. If you count Lionheart, I played on two tracks on Lionheart. Mm -hmm. Her second album. Um, then I did um, Hounds of Love. Hounds mm -hmm. of Love, The Sensual World, and The Red Shoes. That's right, so, yeah. I kind of shared the duties with um, another dear friend of mine, Stuart Elliott, an amazing drummer, mm -hmm. played on all kinds of these. He played on the early Kate Bush stuff. He was also in Alan Parsons' band. Oh, played Alan on the Alan Parsons, Parsons Project stuff. He did some amazing work on the Alan wow. Parsons Project albums. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Stuart, I had a tremendous amount of respect for him. Stuart came onto the scene a little bit before me, uh, but we ended up being contemporaries, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of the 80s and 90s, we were both of us, you know, grade A-list session players, if you like. Mm -hmm. But Kate, yeah, I mean, she's such an iconic artist. Um, every album she put out would, would change the face of music as we knew it. Would, you know, she would just push the boundaries, push the envelope every single time. Yeah. So working for her was extremely um, challenging and very interesting because she was always trying new stuff. She was always experimenting, always right. messing around. And so that was forcing you and the others as well. Yeah. Really, I mean, one, really one day she phoned me up and she said, can you play Bahram? The Irish Bahram. Okay. You know? Yes. And I said, no, but I can learn. <laughs> And I got myself one and I started messing around, kind of working out how to yeah. play it and getting some tips from various people. And um, that's when we went and did Jig of Life um, on the side two of, of The Hounds of Love album. And I did multiple tracks of Irish drums. The small details I love. Wouldn't she bring in like tea, tea and biscuits? Oh yeah, her mother. <laughs> her mother. mother. Really? Her mother, Hannah, dear <laughs> Hannah, would you like a cup of tea, Charlie? She'd come in with tea and biscuits. Oh, and, you know, we'd, we'd kind of sit there and have tea and biscuits <laughs> on a break. And then we'd, we'd go back in and track some more stuff. Some you know? more iconic pieces of music. More iconic okay, pieces speaking of music, of, yeah. Gosh, I mean, we could spend an hour on Kate. <laughs> um, oh, yes. Just on, on any of these. Tracy Ullman. Oh, Tracy. Oh, man. Well, that and that was early on um, in the early mid '80s. After I'd done the first Nick Kershaw sessions, um, I started doing everything that Peter Collins was producing. I got to play on a couple of tracks on one of Tracy Ullman's albums. Uh, both songs, actually, that I played on were written by an old friend of mine, Kirsty McCall. Oh. And one of them was "They Don't Know About Us." Oh. which she'd had a hit with when she was, I think, 15. And she's an incredibly mm -hmm. prolific songwriter. And I yeah. think Tracy, Tracy had tremendous admiration for Kirsty, And she loved her songs because they yeah. had a great sense of humor. 
And so she chose a number of her songs for her, yeah, her really debut cool. album. Mm. Um, I mean, Tracy Ullman always had that element of humour in everything she did, and she liked to, you know. Did you ever see the video that she yes, cut of, of They Don't Know About Us? Of course. Where she's driving in this little three-wheeler, um, Robin yes. Reliant, <laughs> and next to her is Paul McCartney. Oh, that, I didn't clock that. No, it was Paul McCartney. What? Sitting next to, and she's singing, they don't know about Paul McCartney's, Paul McCartney's in the pan, in the seat next to her. Wow. Um, George Michael. Yeah, well, this came from the Elton. This came from Elton. Yeah. Um, because Elton was friends with George. And um, I got to play on their last EP, on, on the Edge of Heaven. And then I did the videos for Edge of Heaven. And I appeared on top of the pops when it was number one. I had driven over to Holland yeah. for us to record Elton's Leather Jackets album at Hilversum. So I drove over with my drums in the car and they had to fly me back over to London from Amsterdam right. to do the top of the pops and record the video for the EP. And then I flew back and actually it was a very sleepless period and I came back uh, with a couple of days growth of beard looking really rough about the edges and um, we I came straight back to Hilversum and they were doing the photographic session for the album sleeve for mm -hmm. leather jackets mm -hmm. and I was going to go and have a shave and the photographer said no no you look perfect <laughs> Really? You look really rough. All right. Because we had to wear all this biker gear and we had to look really rough. So I, actually, I was absolutely perfect. Hans Zimmer. Um, oh. I got to work on the, um, I think, actually, it was his big break at Thelma and Louise. Yeah. Thelma and Louise Thelma was Louise. the soundtrack that, and I think Ridley Scott being in, in British based, I think he used Hans on Thelma and Louise and it was an iconic soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And then, Amazing. and then Hans and I got to work together on part of the Lion King, because he did the, the soundtrack for the Lion King. Mm -hmm. Wow! Okay. And I was working with Elton when Elton did the Lion King. I did all the demos for the Lion King. I played drums on all the demos for the Lion King. I told you everyone's <laughs> heard. Everyone around the world's heard the music. Elton got the um, the Oscar for "Can You Feel the Love Tonight." Mm -hmm. Hans got the Oscar for the best soundtrack right. that year. And it was 1995, we were at the Oscars, playing the Oscars. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know if you know, but the Oscars kind of finishes at eight o'clock because it's okay. West Coast time. Right, okay. So it's 11 o'clock on the East Coast, mm -hmm. it's eight o'clock West Coast time. So everyone then goes back to the hotel, gets changed, and then go to the after show parties. Right. So we did that, I went back to the hotel, I got changed, and then we went to the Four Seasons for the after show party that Elton was holding. And I remember I was walking up the red carpet and Hans was talking to somebody holding his Oscar. I think maybe he was looking for an escape or something like that, but he dragged me in. <laughs> was, I think it was the BBC. Do you remember who was talking to? It was the BBC to? cameras. It was the BBC oh, news sorry, cameras. Sorry, BBC. Yeah. <laughs> he was talking to the BBC news cameras and he said, and this guy, this guy is a, he's a friend of mine. He's the drummer with Elton John and, you know, and, and so he dragged me into, and I had completely unexpected, but I got dragged into some kind of newsreel. I think that there's one last name in this Santa hat. Okay. And it looks like it is Bjork. Bjork. What's our story with Bjork? Um, yeah, I, I was actually very lucky to work on the Dancer in the Dark soundtrack. Oof, jeez. Which is quite interesting. Yeah. Because I think a lot of the, what she did is she, um, well, we were working at Air Lindhurst Studios and um, yeah, I remember I got there really early and I got my drums set up. And so I had some time. So I went to the cafe and I came back into my drum booth to start about 10, 15 minutes before the session. And Bjork was doing her meditation in my drum booth. Oh. <laughs> Okay. She was sitting there, cross-legged, meditating <laughs> in the drum booth. And I walked in and I burst in, you know. She said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, no, hey, whatever. <laughs> Please carry on. So now the only other way I can imagine to cover a career like yours is one of my 
favorite things I like to do in rhythms, and that's a surprise video clips. So here's the first. Charlie, what is this about? Oh, uh, the Bill <laughs> theme tune. Co-writer Andy Pask and I got to write the theme tune for the Bill. Um, which is, ran for 25 years. Exactly, I was going to say. The longest five. running police series, I think, in British television history. We were incredibly lucky. Um, and it paid your mortgage. It paid my mortgage for a long, long time. <laughs> it was, That's yeah. brilliant. And so many of our audience, of course, we got a lot of British expats are watching this too. So again, you're hearing Charlie Morgan's drums and you actually help write the music. Okay, next. There is talk of a reboot. As well. Oh, really? Yeah. Ooh. <gasps> I'm not sure it's going to be on. I'm not sure it's going to be on mainstream television. I think it's going to be on um, UK Gold. You heard it here first. Love it. Okay. Next. Come take my hand. What's happening here? Uh, Olivia Newton-John physical. The video for physical album. I got to um, sit for four or five days behind Olivia playing on all the tracks that were on the physical album. And this is magic, I think. Yes. Yeah, yes. this is magic. Yeah. It's magic. She was wearing this pixie dress, <laughs> absolutely gorgeous. Right in front of you. Right in front of me. She's wiggling her little tushy. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh bless she her, was, who we she lost. Was so sweet. We she, lost not long so ago. Sad. She was such a sweetheart. Um she had really bad flu during the week we were shooting and she was oh. such a trooper. How about this, Charlie? Oh, Moulin Rouge, yeah. This was kind of an interesting um, accident. I got a phone call on my cell phone in the UK from somebody uh, who represented um, Marius de Vries, who was doing part of the soundtrack. Okay. And he was a guy that I worked with in 1989. He was a keyboard player that I worked with. Um, we toured with, uh, he was actually the MD for um, Rick Astley. Oh, Rick first Astley. Met. And I toured with Rick Astley in 1989. And then really? uh, later that year, yeah, later Gosh, that year, name. I was um, co-producing a French project and I used Marius on keyboards for that. Yeah. But anyway, so moving to 1998, um, I'd really already, already left the country and I was back in the UK and I got a phone call saying, could you come to a session? Marius de Vries wants to use you in a session for the latest Baz Luhrmann movie. Right. And I went and played on several tracks for, for <clears throat> Moulin Rouge. Um, specifically, Incredible. we did that version of your song. Oh, of course. They he guess. wanted me to play on that because yes. I've been playing with Elton. Yeah. yeah. He played on your song. Um, and I also, with, uh, I think that was called the Elephant Love Medley or something. Exactly. There, uh, there's a big <laughs> elephant on the roof. Yeah. Um, yes. The and, love and they song. intertwined yes. two songs together. Okay. Love that. Backed up um, uh, Chaka Khan, uh, Lisa Stansfield, Taylor Dane. Wow. Um, Olita Adams yes. and the Moody Blues. Right. How about this? It doesn't matter if you're wrong or if you're right. It makes no difference if you're black or if you're white. Gary Moore, Phil Liner. <clears throat> yeah, this is another Peter Collins production. And uh, working with, again, two iconic musicians. I mean, um, Phil Liner, bass player, lead singer from Thin Lizzy, and Gary Moore, who had a, a major solo career, but also was one of the guitarists in Thin Lizzy. If my opinion is anything to go by, I think he was probably the best guitarist in Thin Lizzy. Ever. Mm. Um, 
I saw the farewell Tim Lizzy concert in Hammersmith Odeon from the audience. Oh, yes. And as far as I'm concerned, Gary Moore wiped, wiped the floor with every other guitarist that appeared yes. on that show. Good. Didn't you say something about your jacket that you've got on there? Yeah, we are wearing these char kind of Charge of the Light Brigade, um, the short, tu <laughs> short tunic jackets, the cavalry jackets. And they were from Berman and Nathan, the um, costumiers who used to uh, supply and also then store a lot of the movie um, costumes. Mm -hmm. And inside my jacket, it said Michael Caine Zulu. So it was the jacket that he wore at some point during the movie Zulu. <laughs> and apparently fantastic. Michael Caine and I have the same size. I was wearing yeah. Michael Caine's yeah. jacket and not a lot of people know that. <laughs> Oh, okay, we've got to slip one of, one of these in. <laughs> and I think that there's quite a story behind this one. How about this? Made in England. Elton live John. Well, Top of the Pops, broadcast live on Top of the Pops from the British Embassy in Paris. Ooh. And my drum kit is set up on the dace on the, um, the platform that the Queen would normally sit on when she was during a state visit. There will be a throne with the Queen underneath that emblem. There I am sitting on it, playing rock and roll drums. I can imagine Elton being a bit jealous about mm. that, actually. I, mean... I think he was quite amused, <laughs> actually. He found it quite amusing. How about this? This was a live DVD we did. Um, I spent 18 years as a member of Orleans, the band, American um, soft rock band. Orleans. Oh, some of their big songs. Still the one. Still the one. Dance with me. Dance with me. We're playing right there. Right. Um, still the one, and um, love takes time. And uh, in that particular video clip, there are two founder members of the band and uh, several long-term members of the band, including myself. So here again, again, switching around so many different artists and styles is wonderful. What's uh, going on here? Uh, this is um, Beverly Craven, 1992, early 92. Um, in Between 1990 and 92, I um, was part of the band that helped break Beverly Craven into the um, spotlight, really. Um, 30 years ago. 30 years ago. And 30 years ago. Recently. And recently, <laughs> I just completed the Woman to Woman tour with Beverly Craven and Judy, Judy Zook, Zook, who I worked with in 1981 and also subsequently into the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, 80s and 90s, I played on, I think, four of Judy's albums. Four of Julia. Yeah, she's one of my oldest friends wow. in the business. Um, and then on your the tour you just finished, you also had Julia Fordham. <coughs> Julia Fordham and, and Rumor. Rumor. Four very different psyches, and somehow they all made it work. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. It was incredible. I saw the it's very last massive. show. The very in last show. Cambridge. Okay. And this just came up, obviously, um, uh, Lisa clocked this just before we started filming today. Um, there was quite an interesting story to this video. Wrap her up, yeah. With the Elton John band, mm -hmm. George Michael. Yeah. Who you, sang yeah, on you're it. You're in the background there, there we yeah. go. Yeah, I'm in the background. We did this at um, Elstree, I think, Elstree Studio. Mm. Oh, who's that? Wait, oh, that's Kiki D, that's and Kiki. she just hit <laughs> right in the face. <laughs> and she didn't know that was gonna happen. No. She did not know that was really? gonna happen. That's actually a song that I co-wrote. It's a song I got a yes. co-write on. I'm playing this drum beat and Elton, I, I remember seeing Elton running across the control room through the glass and pointing. And he was pointing at the cassette machine and they had, they had to put the cassette on and record what I was playing to get a drum sound. Okay. And that rhythm, he wrote a song, that he wrote the song Wrap Her Up around Wrap that rhythm. Her up. Wow. And I got a one sixth credit on it. Well, I know that we are just about out of time. Two lightning round questions. This is hard for you. 
I think maybe a lot of experience. Best gig ever. Best gig ever. Immediately comes to mind. Well, Live Aid's close, but actually, um, no, uh, fifth anniversary of the Berlin Wall coming down. We played a show with Elton on the Brandenburg Gate facing east. Wow. In October of 1994 to an estimated audience of hundreds of thousands of people. They think possibly a half a million, maybe even a million, up to a million people. Um, just a sea of faces in Berlin. <laughs> How about um, this best uh, recording session ever? One of the most fun recording sessions was yes. a recording We Don't Need Another Hero for Tina Turner. For oh, the, from Mad Max, for the Mad Thunderdome. Max, Mad Max Thunderdome. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. What, what, why, why was, what made that fun? Why was that the most fun? Well, the engineer, uh, John, H John Hudson, the engineer, had an idea. Of, he, they wanted a big ambient drum sound. So we recorded that the, the hi-hat snare and kick drum were recorded separately. The main track was recorded separately. All the toms and cymbals were done separately. Um, and if you go back, to, you hear them, and they're right. huge. So you have these big ambient mics. John Hudson had an idea that he wanted to have the drummer's ear view of the drums. So he taped a PZM microphone. He came out with a Mayfair Studios sweatshirt and put that on me, and then we gaffer taped a PZM <laughs> a pressure zone microphone onto my chest so that when I was going around the drums, it would move as I moved and it would get the drummer's, oh, the drummer's wow. view point. And he yes. mixed that into the, the track. So it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun with that. Charlie, I can't think of a better Christmas present for myself than I've had this time talking about all of this music. Cheers to you. Cheers, you're very welcome. Happy holidays to you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Merry Christmas. <laughs>